Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future and future creators. And for all those like really great stories, I'm Ira Pastor, your uh, life sciences ambassador along for the journey. So as we continue uh, upon our theme of health, wellness, and healthy aging, uh, we're going to be taking a, our virtual uh, road trip out west at the West Coast of the United States, the University of Washington, uh, to meet up with Dr. Matt Caberlein, a professor of pathology, adjunct professor of genome sciences, and adjunct professor of oral health sciences at U Washington. Uh, Matt uh, got his PhD uh, from MIT in biology, uh, did postdoc work uh, in genome sciences at University of Washington, and his core research interests uh, are focused on the basic mechanisms of aging, ultimately uh, in order to facilitate the various translational interventions that can help promote health span uh, and improve quality of life. Uh, Dr. Cablin is, uh, you know, has published over 200 papers in top scientific journals, has been recognized by numerous prestigious awards. His contributions have been recognized uh, with fellow status from the American Association Advancement of Science, uh, the American Aging Association, and the Gerontological Society of America. Uh, Dr. Cablin is also past president of the American Aging Association and served on our executive committee and board of directors since 2012. Uh, he's also served as a member of the board of directors of the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, and is currently the chair of the Biologic Sciences section of the Gerontological Science Society of America. Uh, Dr. Cablin also serves on the editorial boards of several journals, including Science and eLife. Uh, his scientific discoveries have generated substantial public interest over the years uh, with stories in major media outlets, uh, including uh, on the front page of the New York Times, uh, he's on Popular Science, Time Magazine, CNN. Uh, and in addition to uh, his primary appointments, uh, he's also the co-director of the University of Washington Nathan Schock Center of Excellence in Basic Biology to Aging, the founding director of Healthy Aging and Longevity Research at the University of Washington, and founder and co-director of the Dog Aging Project, was something we'll get into a little later on the show. Uh, all that being said, Dr. Matt Caberlein, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Sure, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure having you. Um, you know, we typically start off the show by uh, giving our guests the floor for a little bit just to introduce themselves. If you could uh, take a few minutes to talk about who Dr. Matt Caberlein is, um, where you grew up, how you got interested in science and biology, and ultimately how you are now at the epicenter of all things healthy longevity. Um, sure. So I uh, I was born in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, but but my parents moved to Seattle when I was a young child. So I've uh, lived in Seattle for most of my life. Um, you know, I'd say I, I uh, was maybe a, a late bloomer in, in the sense that I, I uh, didn't really find my passion for science until uh, after I had graduated from high school. I spent a couple of years um, working for United Parcel Service, loading trucks in the morning, um, when it, going to community college where I, I you know, really discovered my interest for science and decided that I probably didn't want to load UPS trucks for the rest of my life. Um, so I ended up getting my undergraduate degree at Western Washington University. Um, in biochemistry, uh, and then did my graduate work at MIT. And I actually went to MIT thinking that I would do structural biology, because that's sort of what my, my training had been in as an undergraduate. Um, and it was sort of a happy accident that I heard a talk by Lenny Garenti, mm -hmm. um, who's a professor in biology at MIT, who I ended up doing my thesis work with, where he was talking about how his lab had gotten interested in studying aging. And the, and the um, applying molecular biology and biochemistry and genetics to the, the, the really complex and complicated problem of understanding biological aging. And I was just fascinated by that. Um, so I went and talked to Lenny and ended up joining his lab studying the genetics of aging um, in single-celled organisms um, like budding yeast. And then as a postdoc, I got very interested in this question of you know, what could we really learn about aging from simple organisms like yeast and C. elegans and decided to, um, to try to answer that question, specifically how much of the aging process is evolutionarily conserved. And so that has sort of set the framework um, for the rest of my career, which is really understanding, you know, what are the shared mechanisms of aging across lots of different species? 
with the expectation that those conserved mechanisms of aging are likely to be relevant um, in humans. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was fortunate to be able to get uh, an independent faculty position at the University of Washington to, to live in Seattle um, and, and have my career here. Um, and, and we've continued to try to answer that question. What are the mechanisms of aging? Um, what can we learn uh, about aging from, from these model organisms in efforts to apply them to improve health and longevity in people and, and also in companion dogs? Yeah, you know, when I, I visit your uh, labs, uh, website and you know you have the sort of the general mission of uh, you know targeting the biologic mechanisms of aging and then you know if you're looking at the, sort of this broad um, technological portfolio where you, I'll, I'll refer to sort of a, a zoo <laughs> everything from yeast uh, you have uh, nematodes mice now dogs could you just right. take a, a few minutes to uh, talk about sort of the importance of this principle of conserved mechanisms and sort of, you know, why they are our important to study. Because I think a lot of times people say, oh, you know, we've cured cancer in mice X many times, but so forth. Yeah. And at the same time, some of the challenges uh, that may exist there, and, you know, we, we're all familiar with the stories of uh, drugs that do wonderful in dogs, but then kill people or vice versa, the things that are benign in us, but kill cats and, and aspirin, things like that. Talk about some of those challenges as well. So we just sort of sort of set the stage for uh, sort of why we look at it. Wait, why your lab looks at such a broad swath of uh, organisms across the biologic kingdom. Sure. So I'll actually start with, um, with the, the second half of what you asked, which is this question of, uh, you know, there are, there are lots of examples of drugs that maybe worked well for cancer in mice and did not translate through to humans. I think that's a big concern that people have. And my view on that is, is that actually is um, largely because the models that people have used for human diseases like cancer and Alzheimer's disease and heart disease missed the basic point that those are diseases of aging. Okay. So people engineered mice to get cancer when they were young or to get Alzheimer's disease when they were young. They missed the physiology of the aged animal. And so it is not surprising at all that a drug that works to cure cancer or cognitive decline in a young mouse doesn't work in an old mouse because the biology of an old mouse is fundamentally different than the biology of a young mouse. Just like the biology of an old person is fundamentally different than the biology of a young person. Mm -hmm. um, so, and to give you a concrete example, uh, look at therapies that are based on immune function, like, like cancer therapies that are based on harnessing the power of the immune system to, to fight cancer. Those therapies will work very well in a young mouse or a young person where the immune system is functioning the way that it's supposed to. They won't work in an old mouse or an old person where the immune system is no longer functioning the way that it's supposed to. Um, we see you know, a clear example of that with COVID-19 right now, how the mm -hmm. elderly are at such greater risk for severe complications and death, precisely because their immune system is no longer functioning like a young immune system. So I actually think that is sort of part and parcel of the reason why um, strategies to develop drugs using laboratory models have not lived up to expectations because most of the time, the people developing those drugs don't understand the importance of the biology of aging in, in age-related diseases. So now the, the first part of your question, which is, you know, why do I think that um, this sort of uh, approach of identifying conserved mechanisms of aging is a useful strategy? Um, so I think you could certainly make the argument that if, our inter if we're interested in, in improving human health and longevity, we want to study aging in humans. I, I agree with that. The problem is that's really hard and it takes a really long time. So again, as a concrete example, let's say that I had a drug that I thought would slow aging in people. If you, if you consider what it would take to prove that, sure. um, it would take a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial of about 20 years. Um, it's just really not feasible to understand the mechanisms of aging and to, to do the early uh, technology development in humans because mm -hmm. of the length of time that it takes to study aging in humans. Sure. In laboratory animals, we can do these, these kinds of uh, experiments on the order of weeks to months, which allows us to test lots of different mechanisms, lots of different interventions to identify candidates that then 
um, are, are good candidates to move forward into translational medicine. The obvious downside to that is that not everything about aging will be shared between yeast and worms and flies and mice and people. I think the hope and, and, and now the expectation, given that we've learned a fair amount about the mechanisms of aging, are that many of the fundamental features of aging are shared at the cellular and molecular level. So mm -hmm. while we can't understand everything about human aging, we can learn a lot about the biology of human aging from studying aging in laboratory animals. And at least much of that will be useful for developing therapies um, to, to ameliorate the declines in function that go along with human aging. I appreciate that. I appreciate that overview. Now, I just wanted to set the, set the stage and, and sort of get sure. people more familiar with the, the theme. Um, so coming from that, and, and I, I, um, I pulled, you know, sort of a, a few of uh, your more recent publications with a I mean, you have so many of them that are equally fascinating. I thought we'd start off with this really interesting one just from a couple of weeks ago, uh, entitled uh, "Rapamycin Rejuvenates Oral Health in Aging Mice." Uh, it's it's interesting because we had uh, we actually recently a couple of weeks ago did a show on sort of the general issues that um, that come up with. Um, oral health in, in the geriatric population and in terms of yeah. the changes in the microbiome and, and, and structural stuff and all that bit. And, you know, the, the, the gentleman we're talking to is the dean of a dental school here in Philadelphia, you know, referred to the topic, when you think about it, referred to this topic of dental caries as this un, sort of this hidden pandemic in our mouths. <laughs> we, for years, right. for decades, we've dealt with, you know, stay away from sugars, brush your teeth, use fluoride. But nonetheless, um, and you know, there's been other uh, you know things that have come along in terms of remineralizing agents and, and so forth. Uh, now, rapamycin obviously is a very hot topic nowadays. Um, it is a an agent that inhibits this this mTOR target, which is involved in growth and proliferation, survival of cells. Could you could you take us a little bit on the on a journey for those that are unfamiliar with? Uh, rapamycin and mTOR, if you could sort of introduce that a bit, and then some, a little bit of what you're learning in terms of the study of uh, the oral cavity and, and aging with, with these mice. Sure. So, uh, so rapamycin is a drug that's produced by some bacteria that are found in the soil. It was actually discovered on Easter Island, uh, which is also called Rapa Nui. That's where the name of the drug comes from. Um, and it is a specific inhibitor of a protein called mTOR, which mm -hmm. stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin. So they named the, the protein after the drug. And so as you alluded to, mTOR is sort of this um, central sensor of the environment. So it detects mm -hmm. nutrient availability in the environment. And then it, it, is, uh, in, it is responsible for helping the cell to respond appropriately to the availability of nutrients in the environment. And so one way to think about that is um, if there are lots of food around, that's usually from an evolutionary perspective, that's usually a good time to grow and reproduce. Sure. So mTOR senses that, turns up its activity in response to the nutrients and then promotes cell growth and cell division. The sort of converse of that is that when there's not very much food around, then it's usually a good idea to shut down cell division to become stress resistant. And a byproduct of that stress resistant state is enhanced longevity. And so what, what we and, and many others in the field have observed is that this drug, rapamycin, sort of tricks the cell or the, the animal into thinking that there's not very many nutrients around, turns down mTOR, and that is associated with increased stress resistance and slower aging. And that's been seen in yeast and worms and fruit flies and mice. Um, and there's even a little bit of, of clinical evidence in people that mm -hmm. um, inhibition of mTOR can delay at least some aspects of aging. So it, it fits into this theme of an evolutionarily conserved regulator of aging that can be targeted by this drug rapamycin. So, um, so we knew that when we started thinking about this oral health project. And, and really, um, to be honest, you know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the, your, your prior guest who talked about this hidden epidemic in the mouth, because I had never thought about um, oral health mm -hmm. as an age-related disease. And it was because a, a former graduate student in the lab, Jonathan Ahn, um, who is a, a dental PhD student, or he was at the time, came to me several years ago and he said, you know, I'm really interested in aging and I study 
the mouth. <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> great. But he, he then continued to, uh, to take me through the data on periodontal disease that just like cancers and heart disease and Alzheimer's disease, periodontal disease is a disease of aging. And um, it, it's actually a quite prevalent disease of aging. Something like three fourths of the elderly population in the United States have clinical periodontal disease. So it's highly prevalent. And the people who have periodontal disease are at greater risk for things like dementia and diabetes and heart disease. So it's tied in, um, at least in a correlative way, with other diseases of aging. And so we decided that it made sense to ask the question, do the same mechanisms of aging that affect other age-related diseases affect periodontal disease and health of the oral cavity? during aging. And so that was sort of the rationale for starting these experiments. And so the first thing we had to do was ask, could we use laboratory mice as a model for aging of the oral cavity? Do mice develop periodontal disease? And, and it turns out they do. And we showed this by looking at multiple clinically relevant uh, phenotypes of periodontal disease. So mm -hmm. bone loss around the teeth, inflammation of the gums um, and changes, pathogenic changes in the oral microbiome. So once we convinced ourselves that, that laboratory mice could be a useful model for human periodontal disease, we then asked the question, if we modulate a, a, a pathway or a protein that is important for aging, mm -hmm. could we have an effect on periodontal disease? And that's where rapamycin comes in. And so the experiment was to take mice give them rapamycin and ask, does that affect the progression of, of periodontal disease? And it did. And what was even more striking to us is not only did it slow the rate of periodontal disease progression, it actually reversed the symptoms of periodontal disease in old mice. So that I think is the really exciting aspect of this is we could take old mice that already had these clinically defining features of periodontal disease, mm -hmm. we could give them rapamycin and we could see a reversal in all three of those, those clinical features of periodontal disease. The bone, screwed, the bone around the teeth grew back, the inflammation in the gums and the bone went down. And what is really amazing is the composition of the oral microbiome in the old mice actually shifted back to something that looks more like the composition of a youthful microbiome. So, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because other people have seen similar effects with rapamycin on the aged heart and the aged immune system. So, so we now have three very different organ systems and tissues where we see not just a, an attenuation of biological aging, but a functional rejuvenation, which I think is, you know, it, it's, it's clearly exciting, but from a, from a clinical standpoint, from a translational standpoint, um, the, the potential, I think, is, is, is quite large, that, that we could actually have an impact uh, in people where you've already seen a decline in function um, associated with aging. And so that's what, that's, that, that sort of emergence of, of you know, documented examples of rejuvenation, functional rejuvenation, um, in laboratory animals, I think is very exciting from a translational perspective. And, and rapamycin is sort of at the leading front of that, but there are now emerging other interventions where there's at least early evidence for similar types of, of functional rejuvenation. And so that, that's a very exciting aspect of working in the field right now. Absolutely, I agree with you on that. And the, uh, the whole, the whole connect, I, I, I've always been a you know, big fan of natural products and the fact that you know, rapamycin got its start from some soil how many decades ago, it's got that nice sort of I like to see this sort of repurposing and the discovery of, uh, you know, all these new possibilities from, from, from something that uh, has been around for a while. So that's, that's really neat to see. Um, you, know, you know, moving from uh, mice now to uh, nematodes, um, another recent paper, uh, purification and analysis of C. elegans extracellular vesicles. Um, for folks listening, you know, these are membrane bound vesicles that have uh, contain various proteins and nucleic acids and other metabolites that are really uh, very important for cell-cell signaling. That's part of sort of this basket of uh, these interesting ways that our 50 trillion or so cells communicate with one another. Uh, they just don't sit there quietly, but they're constantly interacting. Um, and, and, you know, you've, you've been focusing on how, uh, what the cells spit out, sorry, very crude term, ultimately helps determine, um, you know, cell A determines what's happening in cell B and C and so forth. Uh, talk a little bit, if you would, about what you're learning uh, in studying these, uh, as you put it, uh, these genetic cargoes of material. So, um, 
So this, this idea, as you alluded to, that, that cells are in constant communication with each other and that these um, what we call cell non-autonomous signals are important in aging goes back for, for many years. Mm -hmm. um, this you know, was first established from work in C. elegans where it became clear that signals uh, derived both from neurons and, and from the gonad can have an effect on the overall lifespan of the organism. And, and that now has been seen in other, uh, in other animal models as well. Um, and so this certainly um, suggested that, that, that these, these cell non-autonomous signals are likely to be a sort of a universal feature of the regulation of health and longevity. And so um, it's remained unclear uh, and still is to this day largely exactly how those intras intracellular uh, signals are being packaged and sent and received by by the appropriate um, target cells. And so extracellular vesicles uh, were a logical place to start looking for, for some of these signals. Um, uh, nobody previously had really developed a method for purifying and characterizing these extracellular vesicles in C. elegans. So the extracellular vesicle field has sort of exploded over the last five to 10 years, mostly um, from studies in people and to some extent in mice, because it's relatively easy to purify these vesicles from, from blood or from, from urine. Um, but really, it, it, uh, there haven't been a lot of tools developed for studying these things in a more mechanistic way in invertebrate models like worms and, and flies. So a postdoc in my lab, Josh Russell, who um, has been very interested in extracellular vesicle signaling for many years, set out to really try to develop the tools to allow us to, to, to dive deeply into the biology of extracellular vesicles. And so he um, uh, really did the pioneering work of figuring out, you know, how do we purify these things from, from nematodes? How do we separate them away from the vesicles that, that come from the, the microbiome that the worms eat? So worms in the lab eat E. coli, E. coli bacteria produce extracellular vesicles. So you need a way to purify them, make sure you're getting the worm vesicles, um, and then do a lot of groundwork to really prove that, that we have indeed purified bona fide extracellular vesicles. Um, and so, so that's, that's kind of what he has been working on. And we just, um, just got a paper accepted in the journal Geroscience that sort of does the first large scale analysis and characterization of the worm extracellular vesicles um, at the protein level and at the RNA level. So I think we're in the very early days of really being able to, to, to look um, in a very detailed way to ask what are, what are the roles of extracellular vesicles in aging and age-related diseases? Um, I will say that, you know, from the mammalian literature and, and from the human literature, it's become clear that, that, that extracellular vesicles are, are probably very important in uh, neurodegenerative diseases, age-related neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Um, potentially through a couple of different mechanisms. So, so, uh, so one way that they might be important is as, a, is as a, uh, a place to stick the bad proteins that accumulate during these diseases like amyloid beta or mm -hmm. alpha-synuclein. Um, uh, it's a way to, to, to put these toxic proteins into a compartment and get that out of the cell. Um, and that seems to be the case not only in neurodegenerative diseases, but Monica Driscoll's lab at Rutgers has shown that worms do this. So they make these very large extracellular vesicles as they get old that are probably a kind of a dumping ground for, for, for uh, accumulated garbage that has, has, uh, has accumulated during aging. So that's a good part, potentially, mm -hmm. of extracellular vesicles. The bad part is that sometimes those get taken up by other cells, because that's kind of what their normal job is. And so there's some thought that they may actually be important in the spreading of diseases like Alzheimer's disease throughout the brain. So the disease might start in one very specific region of the brain, or maybe even it starts earlier outside of the brain, and these vesicles then are the seed that transports the toxic stuff to the brain or helps it spread throughout the brain. Um, so there may be a sort of a dark side to these vesicles, not something that they evolved to do, mm -hmm. but it's a byproduct of the normal aging process that, um, that they're then, they then uh, can contribute to this spreading of pathology um, as we get older. And so that's, I think, will be an area that we look at in the future. And, and I know there are lots of other labs who are interested in, in studying and understanding that as well. Really interesting stuff. 
Uh, let's go down one, one, one more level and then we'll come up to big organisms. Um, uh, trajectories of aging, how systems biology and yeast can illuminate mechanisms of personalized aging. Uh, and here you go into the sort of the principle that uh, we normally think of aging being sort of invariant between individuals. Uh, but now, you know, with, with yeast, you're now able to study individual cells in ways that ultimately how and when these yeast bud, how the mother cell may give rise to many different organisms that are very different age-wise. Uh, what are you learning from that? And what ultimately can we apply to uh, not just how I'm different than, I age differently than my wife, uh, but uh, are there, you know, what can we say about how parts of my body are aging faster or slower than, uh, than other cells in, in different areas? Different people age differently at the, the phenotypic level, at the, the level of sort of traits that we can see. My beard goes gray earlier than somebody else's beard, right? There's sort of been this assumption, and I don't know how much people have really thought about it, but it's kind of talked about in an assumed way that at the molecular level, aging is is the same across individuals, that, that the molecular changes that go along with aging, the hallmarks of aging, so to speak, mm -hmm. are universal and everybody ages the same way. And I'm not sure that there's a lot of uh, reason to believe that's true. And so, so the idea here was to try to develop a tractable experimental system where we could actually test that at the single cell level. And we felt that yeast was a, was a good model organism to, to test that idea because it's a single celled organism. So we can, we can do experiments at the single cell level and they're both individual cells and individual organisms at the same time. So, um, and, and I was fortunate to, to have another postdoc in the lab, uh, Matt Crane, who had experience um, with microfluidic technology. So we had both the model system and the technology that allowed us to, to try to address this, this question. And so these microfluidic uh, devices that Matt developed trap individual yeast cells and allow us to follow them with time-lapse micros microscopy throughout their entire lifespan at the single cell level. And we can then use um, reporters, so fluorescent proteins, uh, that, uh, that tell us about um, different changes to subcellular structures with mm -hmm. age. Um, so we can tag the mitochondria, or we can tag the lysosome, or we can tag the DNA with these fluorescent proteins, and with, um, with time-lapse microscopy, see how the structure of these subcellular uh, compartments changes with age. And so the first set of experiments was just to ask at the, at the subcellular level, do, do all cells age the same way or do we see the, the, the same types of phenotypic differences that we see in people, right, mm -hmm. among different individual cells? And it turned out that, um, that's, that individual cells at the level of subcellular structures are, are, are massively different in the, the, the changes that they undergo during aging. Um, so that really, I think, supported the idea that, that there are sort of personalized molecular trajectories of aging, that not every cell goes down the same molecular pathway during aging. Um, and so now what, what we're doing, and, and uh, there's another uh, investigator named Nan Howe at UCSD who's kind of working along a similar line, is trying to understand, you know, at a, at a mechanistic detailed way, how many different trajectories of aging are and what do they look like at the molecular level? And, and I would say we don't know the answer to that yet. I, I think so far between Nan's work and our work, we can come up with, with probably three or four at least sort of fundamentally different pathways that cells can go down as they age. And, and maybe one way to think about these pathways is, is you know, what breaks first at the subcellular level? Mm -hmm. um, Maybe the lysosome breaks first in some cells and the DNA, uh, the appropriate uh, replication and segregation of chromosomes breaks first in other cells. So we can sort of, we're sort of at that level of resolution um, and, and we're continuing to try to, 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 to dig deeper and, and, and uh, understand this in a more detailed way. So that's in yeast. I think, um, you know, the question is, uh, is the same thing true and in individual cells in a worm or a mouse or a person? Uh, we don't know the answer to that yet. We're trying to develop tools uh, along with a, a collaborator of ours uh, named Alex Mendenhall at the University of Washington to do this in worms. Mm -hmm. um, my guess is that it will turn out to be the same in worms and mice and, and people. Um, and so I think that 
that's important to understand uh, at least at the level of order of breakdown within cells, what's happening. Because, um, you know, maybe one way to think about it is for now, the field has been largely focused on genetic pathways that affect lifespan. And we've been pretty successful at that. That's how mTOR came out. That's how the sirtuins came out. Um, but if we really want to get beyond that, I think we need to start understanding aging at a more molecular level and at an individual level, because it might turn out to be the case that rapamycin will work really well for me, but it's not going to work really well for you. Right. And, and, and we need tools to be able to predict at an individual level which interventions are going to be most effective. And I think this is a start towards, uh, towards having that sort of uh, personalized understanding. All right, let's, uh, let's jump forward in the evolutionary uh, chain of events to dogs. Um, okay. Looks like you, you may have 10,000 of them or so on your hands soon. Uh, well, 10,000 dogs, 10 years, $15 million budget. Um, so, so take us through, I mean, this is very exciting because uh, you know, most, most folks working in drug development and especially aging you know, could only hope for we talk about large animals that uh, they get a lot closer to uh, to us. Um, this very exciting project. Uh, can you walk us through a little bit of what you are doing, what you envision, um, what you're going to be looking at in terms of uh, the, uh, the the genome, the genomics, and the various health assessments? It's a, it's a really fascinating story. Sure. So so this is all part of uh, something we call the dog aging project. And, and maybe a good place to start is, um, you know, why would we even think about studying aging in, in dogs, and in particular, companion dogs or, or pet dogs. So I think, you know, the first thing I want to say is, is all of the, uh, the, the studies as part of the dog aging project are studies of pet dogs living at home with their owners. So I'm a dog person. I've had dogs all of my life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know that different people have different feelings about research on uh, animals. Uh, personally, I would not want to be involved in a project that studied dogs in the laboratory. So, so everything in the dog aging project um, is is trying to understand the biology of aging in pet dogs. So, why pet dogs? Um, I think there's a couple of obvious uh, reasons why dogs are a, a a useful animal in which to try to study the biology of aging. Um, as we already talked about. You know, if, if we wanted to do a long-term study of aging in people, that would take multiple decades. Uh, because dogs age about seven to ten times faster than people do, we can study the life, the entire lifespan of a dog about seven to ten times faster than we can do that in, in people. So we can really get answers on genetic and environmental factors that influence the aging process in dogs in a time frame that, that is uh, amenable to to. to uh, rigorous scientific research. Um, dogs also share the human environment, uh, pet dogs do, um, in a way that, you know, with the exception maybe of pet cats, no other animal um, uh, does. And so if one of the goals is to, to, to try to understand what's important for healthy longevity in people, the human environment is something that we miss completely in laboratory studies of mice or worms or, or yeast. We can actually capture most of that in studies of pet dogs. Um, so those are two, you know, I think sort of fundamental scientific reasons why this makes a lot of sense. Another reason is people love their dogs. I love my dogs. Um, there are, uh, uh, I think something like 70 million pet dogs in the United States and more than half of the, the people who own pet dogs consider their dogs to be part of their family. So mm. people love their dogs. And I think that, um, that the dog aging project, uh, overall is an opportunity to engage people who maybe wouldn't otherwise be engaged in science or the science of aging um, in this topic. Uh, and so, so I think that that is uh, potentially a very valuable aspect to, to the dog aging project. So, um, so that's sort of an overview of why, why, why I think the dog aging project is, is uh, both scientifically justified and hopefully will, will be important um, for the field. Um, so there are really two parts to the dog aging project. The, by far the largest part is uh, what we call a longitudinal study of aging in dogs. Mm -hmm. This is completely non-interventional and that's where the, the 10,000 number comes from. It turns out that the longitudinal study of aging is actually much larger than 10,000 dogs. So, um, so we're hoping that we can get up to 100,000 dogs in, wow. into the longitudinal study. 
Um, we have so far about 80,000 people who have asked to par participate. Um, and so that, the goal of the longitudinal study will be simply to follow as many dogs as possible throughout their lifespan and try to understand and tease apart what are the most important genetic and environmental factors that influence health and longevity in pet dogs. And so that longitudinal study is, is going to be broken up into a, a series of groups. The largest group, the hopefully 100,000 plus group is what we call the Dog Aging Project PAC. Um, those dogs uh, uh, will have information on those dogs from, from uh, high resolution surveys that the owners complete mm -hmm. and their electronic veterinary medical records. Um, a subset of those dogs, which right now we're funded to do uh, 10,000, will be part of the, the foundation, the Dog Aging Project Foundation. Um, those dogs will also get full genome sequencing. So we'll have the survey information, medical records, and full genome sequencing on those dogs. Mm. Another one dogs are part of what we call the precision group. And those dogs are the ones where we'll get this sort of um, high resolution omics data. So we'll get annual microbiome data, uh, metabolome data, um, and, and vet ongoing veterinary uh, checkups for all of those dogs um, uh, throughout the course of the study. And so that will be the group that allows us to do sort of the more sophisticated analyses to really try to tease apart the molecular correlates of, of healthy aging. But all of those groups together um, will create, you know, what is going to be a gigantic data set um, uh, with, with lots of uh, opportunities, not just for aging, but for other diseases that affect dogs. So I think there's an important veterinary medicine component to this, mm -hmm. but also diseases that affect dogs that also affect people that are not necessarily age related because we'll be following these dogs over their entire lifespan. And so we recognize the importance of making this an open data project. And so that is sort of one of the, the foundational principles of the Dog Aging Project is that, that we want to get this data out there for the scientific community to, to, and the veterinary community to analyze um, as rapidly as possible. So, um, so our hope is that this will uh, rapidly grow into the largest citizen science project in the world. And I think we're well on our way um, to that, to accomplishing that. Um, and I think it, it is an opportunity to, like I said, engage a lot of people um, because it's a, a, a topic about the biology and health of companion dogs to engage a lot of people in science who otherwise might not be exposed to science. Um, so then, so that's the largest part of the dog aging project. Um, the, there is also a, a veterinary clinical trial of rapamycin. The goal of that clinical trial is different from the longitudinal study. So as I said, the longitudinal study is non-interventional. We're not going to ask owners to do anything different with their dogs than they normally would. The rapamycin clinical trial, which we call TRIAD, because every clinical trial has to have a, a name. Yeah, that right. stands for Trial of Rapamycin in Aging Dogs. Um, uh, is designed to, to, to ask and answer the question, does rapamycin slow aging in pet dogs? And so that is a, a clinical trial, uh, double blind, placebo controlled, randomized clinical trial, um, where we will seek to enroll 500 dogs. Uh, half of them will be placebo, half of them will get rapamycin to get 350 dogs into and through the entire three year um, study period. The dogs, so the, the primary outcome on that study is lifespan. So it really is powered and designed to, to ask and answer whether rapamycin can increase lifespan in pet dogs. Um, we'll look at a variety of secondary endpoints, um, including cardiac function, cancer incidence, cognitive function, activity, kidney function, to, to really try to um, address whether rapamycin not only affects lifespan in dogs, but can also broadly delay or reverse the declines um, that go along with aging in, in pet dogs. Um, and again, this really, I think, points to the power of of pet dogs for this kind of study. To do the same study in people, you know, would take us two to three decades, right. really, to, to really definitively answer the question, does rapamycin increase lifespan? Because of the way we've designed it, <clears throat> all of the dogs are middle aged when they come in and, it's, mm -hmm. and, and they have to be a certain weight category because big dogs age faster than small dogs. Uh, we should be powered to detect a 15% change in lifespan in three years in our cohort. So it's feasible to actually do the, the rigorous um, uh, controlled clinical trial in pet dogs that would be 
very challenging to do in humans. Fascinating study. I wish you best luck with it. It's uh, it's uh, it's it's amazing well to hear about it, but at the same time that uh, as I, you know, I said earlier, when it's nice to hear about larger <laughs> larger organisms and, sure. and generating the data in this context. Um, real really fascinating stuff, Matt. Um, Coming back to you for a moment, uh, we, we, we typically, you know, ask our guests a, a question uh, in the wrap up sort of about uh, important influencers and mentors uh, throughout their career. No doubt you've met quite a bunch of fascinating people along the way. Uh, any specific individuals that um, you may want to highlight, give a shout out to at this point that really uh, define that this was going to be your path, uh, and you know, if it wasn't for them, uh, Matt Caberlin would be off doing something else at this point. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, I think you know, like like most people, I have uh, had had many people who have had an influence on on my career and, and my direction. I think you know, I already talked about Lenny Garenti, who I did my right. PhD work with. Um, if it wasn't for Lenny, I probably would have never even thought about the biology of aging as something to study. Um, and then once I got to the University of Washington, I would say there were really three people uh, who who kind of took me under their wing and and really served as mentors um, uh, who have been instrumental in my career development. Um, one of those people is George Martin, um, who anybody who's in the aging field knows George, and, and he is perhaps the most beloved figure in the field because because um, he is just a, a fantastic human being and and supports everybody who he comes across. I was lucky that George was at the University of Washington when I came there and gave me the guidance and en encouragement um, throughout my, my career. Um, Peter Rabinovich, who is a, a, a progen progeny, I guess, prodigy <laughs> of George's. So he was, a, I believe, a, a postdoc with George, also at the University of Washington, um, still there, um, uh, uh, was the director of the training grant who, that I was supported by when I came to the University of Washington and, and is co-director of the Nathan Schock Center with me now, um, has been an ongoing mentor to me throughout the years. Um, and then Brian Kennedy, who was uh, at the time a professor of biochemistry at the University of Washington, also a former graduate student of Lenny Garenti's. Um, so there's a connection there, even though we didn't overlap at the time. Um, when I got to the, to the University of Washington as a postdoc, um, Brian and I sat down and, and had coffee um, and, and basically through that discussion, um, made the decision to work together to try to do something that I think most people at the time would have thought was crazy, which was to take a completely unbiased approach to, to lifespan and just measure the lifespan of 5,000 different, um, genetically unique yeast strains to try to answer the question of, um, instead of focusing on what we thought was important, stepping back and letting the biology tell us what was important. And it was actually that collaboration, which you know, ultimately ended up taking a decade to finish. Um, it was that collaboration that led us to mTOR and to rapamycin. We, we were lucky that mTOR, the mTOR deletion strain happened to be in the first 500 strains that we looked at. But we you know, by no means were smart enough to go looking for it, or at least I wasn't, maybe Brian was. Um, we didn't go looking for it. But the, but the biology told us what was important. And I think that's something that gets missed a lot of times um, in the, you know, today's focus on being very mechanistically driven is it's less, uh, less observational and, and more driven by a model that we think is already true instead of really letting the biology tell us what's going on. So, so anyways, Brian and I have had an ongoing collaboration um, for 17 years now, mm -hmm. published, you know, I don't know, 100 papers together. Um, so it's, you know, that has been certainly the most influential scientific collaboration and friendship that I've had. And there's, there's no question that I would not, I would not be where I'm at now if it wasn't for, for, uh, for that collaboration and, and that interaction with Brian throughout the years. Very, very important set of mentors there, I have to say. <laughs> very impressive. Uh, well, this has really been exciting, eye-opening. I'm really wishing you the best in all these projects moving forward. I'm going to love to, to keep an eye on the dog uh, study. I, I'm a bird guy, so I don't have any dogs around the house. But I, if, you, if you do a bird study, I, bird aging project. <laughs> I'd get involved in that. Um, for everybody that's going to be watching on the Idea Me YouTube channel or listening on the various uh, podcast 
uh, networks that this interview is going to go out on. Uh, you've been listening to the amazing Dr. Matt Caberlain, professor of pathology, adjunct professor of genome sciences, and adjunct professor of oral health sciences at the University of Washington, uh, doing amazing things and understanding the conserved mechanisms of aging ultimately to, to target the mechanisms and promote healthy longevity in all of us. Uh, Matt, thank you for taking the, the, the early time out of your schedule to come on the show. Uh, thank you for everything you do. Uh, and as we say on the show, thank you for what well, you say, thank you for moving the human story forward, but also thank you for moving the dog, mouse, nematode, and, and yeast story forward as well. It's, it's really been eye-opening and, and great having you today. Great. It's been, it's been fun. Thanks so much for coming on.